Good afternoon. I believe we have a full house, and thank you all for coming today. As most of you all know, my name is Frances Coleman, and I'm Dean of Libraries, and certainly on behalf of the library faculty and staff, I do welcome you to the uh, Marzalat Speaker Series. Some of you may not realize this, but if you'll turn over on the back of your program, you will see this, including this program today, this is the 13th year. Is that right, Dr. Marzalak and Jean? Uh, I think we uh, discovered that earlier. I kept thinking that it was going to be the 13th uh, year for the Templeton, but Stephen Canetto reminded me that I was wrong. So uh, it's the 7th or 8th for the Templeton. Nine. The 9th. <laughs> So glad I have such smart faculty and staff, and certainly I am blessed with some very uh, capable individuals with whom I work, and uh, if it were not for them, uh, you would not be here today. And if it were not for John and Jean Marzalak and their generosity, this program would not be in effect today. And it has really been most helpful not to the library and to those of you who have come to hear the excellent speakers uh, who have been with us, but it is helpful to these students who receive these uh, honorariums and also have an opportunity to make a presentation before an audience. I, I think that's very helpful. Now, our speaker today, I think he's very nervous, and I've been very nervous. He's nervous about his talk, and I've been nervous about pronouncing his name. <laughs> so... Uh, we, we each are nervous, but we do thank you all for coming. Uh, each time we have a program and a speaker, I think, well, this is the best we've ever had. But I want to tell you that uh, we've had a wonderful time with uh, Dr. Victoria Bynum and Dr. Greg Andrews. Uh, is that right, Dr.? That's right. Yeah. We made a mistake last night with the place cards in that Dr. Greg Andrews is uh, the husband of our speaker. Would you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> I was seated by him at dinner last night, and he didn't say a word, except we realized suddenly that we had the wrong last name on his card. <laughs> so we did apologize. But we've had an excellent... Uh, time of visiting with them. They're each very accomplished. Certainly our speaker today is an accomplished individual, and I know you'll enjoy hearing from her. But uh, going back to uh, Dr. Andrews, uh, you didn't bring your guitar. They are both retired history professors, so uh, Dr. Marzalak, where's your guitar? He has a lot. Yeah, where's your accordion? <laughs> but um, you are in for a treat. It's very good, and, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I do have uh, Dr. Lori Bruce today, who is the Associate Vice President and Dean of the Graduate uh, Student uh, of the Graduate School, excuse me, not just the students, and uh, who will introduce our speaker today. And, of course, we have our recipient of the Marzalak Graduate Student Award. <laughs> Please read your program. <laughs> He's a great guy, and we had dinner with him last night, and he is here today, and we did practice, but I, my notes are just really bad. So I, we're going to let... Uh, uh, Dr. Bruce do justice to him in just a few minutes. Uh, you will be hearing uh, Dr. Mike Ballard is a professor emeritus of the <coughs> library. So many of you already know uh, Mike. You will uh, remember him as having worked here at the library. He is a noted author uh, himself. And Mike, we appreciate your coming back to be with us, and uh, this will not be the last time. Then I, we'll have special remarks after we hear from Dr. Bynum, and we'll hear special remarks from John and Jean Marzalak, and then Peter Ryan will close uh, the program for us. 
I hope I've had several of you come up to me and say, you know, I know about Jones County and I'm from Jones County. And I said, well, please, I hope you have an opportunity to talk with our special guest. Uh, we've just enjoyed uh, having them with us so much. They're just folks like us. And we just went over our time this morning, I think. I hope you all weren't late going on to the next appointment. I do want to remind all of you that we deeply appreciate the work that uh, John and Jean Marzalak do for not just our community, but for the library as well. They really uh, helped us move through in purchasing some materials that otherwise we would not have. And as I said earlier, was if it were not for their donations, we would not have the scholarships that we have for the students. So let's thank them right now. Let's go on with the program then, and Dr. Bruce, would you come and introduce the speaker? And I'm going to check you on the pronunciation. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Um, I will say before I before I read Groshen Krzyzewski's bio, um, I, I would like to say that <clears throat> you know being dean of the graduate school is not just a privilege; it's a pleasure, and this is one of the reasons it's such a pleasure. Um, to be able to interact with graduate students across campus in so many disciplines and some far outside my discipline of electrical and computer engineering and to find the students, um, the high caliber of the students academically, scholarly, um, and just as individuals and people um, and their well-rounded backgrounds. It's really a pleasure to, to interact with the graduate students. And I wanted to say that not just about Groshen, but about the other students um, uh, before I read his bio. And once I read his bio, you'll understand why that's such a pleasure to serve as the dean. Um, Groshen is a dual citizen of the United States and Poland. His home state is Pennsylvania. And after graduating cum laude, from King's College with a Bachelor of Arts in History in 2009. He entered the History Graduate Program here at Mississippi State, um, earning his Master of Arts in History in 2012. He passed his doctoral exams in 2014 and is now working on his dissertation. Um, Groshen is a member of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and a recipient of scholarly awards, including a travel grant from the, now this is where my pronunciation might not be right, the Kushwa Center um, uh, for the study of American Catholicism to study at the University of Notre Dame um, where he worked in the archives and the James W. Garner Scholarship at Mississippi State University. Uh, he's worked as a teaching assistant um, in the history department here at Mississippi State since 2010 and he also uh, works as a translator from Polish to English his recent publications include a material culture analysis of a 1911 Ulysses S. Grant tobacco card, militaristic nationalism and pseudo-religion. And I wonder where he gained access to that. <laughs> um, another one of his recent publications is um, Catalyst for Revolution, uh, Pope John Paul II's 1979 pilgrimage to Poland and its effects on solidarity and the fall of communism. And not only is Groshen an accomplished scholar, he's also an accomplished athlete. He um, has played baseball at King's College and has played professionally in Europe and for the Polish national team. Please help me welcome to the podium Groshen Krzyzewski. <laughs> Good afternoon. The title of my talk is Entangled Allegiance, Catholics in the Civil War South. When Natchez fell to the Union in June of 1864, Bishop William Henry Elder received a federal order requiring all pastors of churches to read a prayer expressive of a proper spirit towards the President of the United States. Elder refused. Asked again, Elder definitively and positively declined. For his recalcitrance, he was arrested and deported to nearby Vidalia, Louisiana. His captivity lasted just 18 days, and he was released unconditionally, returning to Natchez to resume his Episcopal duties and not to be bothered with the prayer requests again. Elder's actions seem to imply overt Confederate sympathy, but that is not the case. 
A week before his arrest, he wrote the following in his diary. Some Catholics and many more Protestants were under the impression that my refusal to read the prayer arises from a preference which I give to the Southern Confederacy. I want them to understand it was not so, but simply from an unwillingness to acknowledge the right in any secular power to direct our religious worship. Elder's actions highlight the multifaceted allegiance questions Catholics face in the South, a fact heightened by war. Southern Catholics were Confederate citizens and members of a church, both foreign and universal, having to simultaneously balance local, national, and international ties. It is therefore natural to undertake a study of Civil War allegiance questions with Catholicism at the center, which this paper does via an investigation of Southern bishops, chaplains, and sister nurses. Bishops acted in moderation, supporting secession cautiously while devoting much of their energy to pastoral and peace concerns. Chaplains were ardent Confederates. Catholic sister nurses were the most impartial of the three groups, the most apolitical. While these groups' devotion to the Confederacy differed, all three were Catholics first, putting religious concerns above matters of the state, demonstrating that perhaps the common thread of Southern Civil War Catholicism was an Augustinian approach to faith and society. Uniform prioritization and similarity of action in the former realm with nuance and times greatly varied expression in the latter. Near the outbreak of the war, Elder took a measured tone. Dissatisfied with the conflict, he wrote to Bishop of Charleston, Patrick Lynch, that Catholic clergymen should do anything we of the South can and ought to to abate the war fever among the clergy and Catholic lady of the North. Not reserving his criticism for Northerners alone, Elder chastised the rashness of Southern secession, led by fire eaters who were, according to him, fanatics bent on gaining an end which they would pursue by any means necessary. Lynch, in a letter to Archbishop of New York, John Hughes, wrote, All the hopes cherished last spring of a peaceful solution have vanished before the dread realities of war. It was unnecessary from the beginning. It will be fruitless of any good. Pro-Southern Louisville Bishop Martin John Spaulding believed that Catholics should do their part to impede catastrophe by repentance, fasting, and prayer, to avert or at least mitigate the awful calamity. Richmond Bishop John McGill claimed he was daily praying for peace, and Archbishop of Baltimore Francis Kenrick, in a letter to Lynch, asked him to pray that God may spare the country and grant peace. Once fighting got underway, Elder gave his guarded support to the South. In a letter to Kenrick, he said, My course, and I believe the course of my clergy, has not been to recommend secession, but to explain to those who, who might inquire that their religion did not forbid them to advocate it. He added the Confederacy was the only government which exists here de facto. Southern bishops did as a whole support the Confederacy, but their primary focus was in pastoral matters. A brief look at Elder's war record centered upon discharging his priestly duties is typical of Southern Catholic bishops. Elder spent many long uninterrupted sessions with soldiers, hearing confessions and celebrating the mass. His hospital ministry was ceaseless and extended in equal measure to African Americans <coughs> as to whites. Elder regularly visited the African American camps, baptizing children and adults who wanted to enter the church, and he often sent religious items to his black congregants when asked, as when he sent a man named Alonzo a rosary. Elder's ministry also extended beyond Confederate lines. Upon his return from Vidalia, Elder put in application with Union General Mason Brayman, the man who arrested him in the first place for the purpose of visiting the United States soldiers sick in hospital. As historian Charles E. Nolan has shown, Elder stayed close to his flock, perpetually on long, lonely trips by steamboat, horse, carriage, or railroad, to administer the sacraments, offer religious instruction, console the bereaved, or simply visit isolated Catholic families. Other Catholic bishops likewise placed religious concerns ahead of politics and war. Savannah Bishop Augustine Vereau traveled throughout the South seeking funds for Lynch's Charleston congregation, impoverished by the blockade and a devastating fire. In a later letter to, to Lynch, Vereau asks him to send money to help nuns rebuild a convent. Vereau's November 1863 peace pastoral, inspired by Pope Pius IX's peace letter to Hughes and New Orleans Archbishop Jean-Marie Oda, was preceded by Lynch's 1863 pre-Lenten address. At a time when Confederate victory was still a realistic possibility, in February of 1863, Lynch did not instruct his Charleston congregation to pray for military success, but
but to fast and pray for a speedy end to the war. In contrast to bishops, chaplains were at the high end of Catholic commitment to the Confederacy. Father Luis Hippolyte Gash of the 10th Louisiana Volunteer Regiment claimed that pursuing retreating federal troops was, quote, the greatest thrill of my life, while he gleefully reveled in the sight of, quote, shells exploding in the midst of these confused and terrified troops. Such effusive militarism aside, Catholic chaplains proved themselves to the men they served by bearing the same hardships common soldiers endured. Chaplains' close proximity to battle heightened their feelings of allegiance and engendered an uncompromising loyalty to the South. In Father James Sheeran's case, evident in his refusal to cooperate with the Union during a month-long imprisonment. On October 31st, 1864, Sheeran was placed in military prison in Winchester, Virginia. It was common practice for clergymen to be granted passes to move between enemy lines, but this time Sheeran was both denied a pass and arrested. He spent a week in Winchester before his November 8th transfer to Baltimore. Sheeran, along with other men, was led up dilapidated stairs outside an old brick building and then into a dark room where the prisoners were being held. He and the incoming inmates were greeted with calls of, fresh fish, fresh fish. His first night in the Baltimore prison passed as such. We had hardly laid our wearied bodies down on the hard, filthy, and vermin-covered floor then the former inmates of this institution, inspired as it were by the devil, commenced what appears to be their regular nocturnal exercises. They first had a quarrel, real or pretended, in which vulgarity, obscenity, and profanity, such as I had never heard, were exhibited. One would burst out with some verse or phrase of an obscene or vulgar song. Soon another would begin to grunt like a hog, others bark like a dog, another quack like a duck. Is it needless to say I slept none? Who could sleep? On November 17th, Sheeran was informed he would be released if he took an oath of allegiance to the United States. He refused. He refused again on, on November 28th, saying, To take such an oath would require on my part a sacrifice of honor and conscience, which I am prepared to make for no earthly consideration. When he finally was released, the Union government tried to get him to sign a parole, promising to, quote, deport myself as a good and loyal citizen of the United States. I will do no such thing, Sheeran said risking an immediate return to prison. But unlike Bishop Elder, he had no qualms about stating his unequivocal Southern partisanship, as opposed to protesting state interference in religious affairs, saying, I belong to the South and am a chaplain in the Confederate Army. My home is in the South, and there I demand to be sent. He was eventually released unconditionally. While Southern Catholic bishops cautiously, cautiously supported the South and chaplains aggressively so, Catholic nuns are roundly lauded for their political disinterestedness and singular dedication to spiritual and physical healing. Sister Mary Dennis Maher points out that at least 617 sisters from 21 different communities ministered to soldiers throughout the war. And these women were pathbreakers in a variety of ways. In the 19th century, it was widespread belief that a woman's place was in the domestic sphere. Yet as Sister Frances Jerome Wood shows, the sisters were not stifled by the restrictions Southern society placed upon women. They challenged laws prohibiting the education of slaves. Through their vows, the religious women were liberated to express their love of God and neighbor and to give witness to gospel values. They had no fear of losing material goods, for what they had was at the service of their neighbor. Through their vow of celibacy, the sisters were free to defy the norms that marriage was the proper state of life for women and that women should be dependent upon their husbands. The sisters' primary Civil War contribution was spiritual and medical, and it's important to note these sisters were not simply compassionate women, they were medical professionals. As Maher writes, sisters were the only trained nurses available at the start of the Civil War, before you see this mass influx of volunteers both North and South. A fact highlighted by Father William B. Faraday, who writes, the country only had 600 trained nurses at the start of the Civil War, all were Catholic nuns. This is one of the best kept secrets in our nation's history. Often the cleanest, most efficient, and most medically up-to-date hospitals of the time were staffed by Catholic sisters. In addition to providing good medical care, the sisters' practice of their faith won many converts to Catholicism. Father Francis Berlando claimed that prejudices against Catholicism disappeared once soldiers were under the care of sister nurses. A non-Catholic soldier stated, I am not of your church, and have always been taught to believe it to be nothing but evil. However, actions speak louder than words, 
and I'm free to admit if Christianity does exist on earth, it has some of its closest followers among the ladies of your order. Confederate Nate nurse Kate Cumming, an Episcopalian, praised Catholic nuns while berating stay-at-home Southern women who would not help at hospitals unless a relative was present, asking, I wonder if the Sisters of Charity have brothers in the hospitals where they go. It seems strange they can do with honor what is wrong for other Christian women to do. Soldiers would ask for instruction on the white bonnet religion, and one asked to be baptized, but only if a sister would do it. Father John Bannon, who earned the nickname the Confederacy's Fighting Chaplain, recounts the story of a soldier who wanted to join the sister's religion but did not believe it could be the Catholicism he had grown up abhorring. When Bannon gave the soldier some doctrinal instruction, the soldier protested, Oh, come on now, you don't expect me to believe that. All it took was for a sister to confirm she believed the doctrine, that the priest and she were of the same faith, for the man to be convinced and say, very well, all right, I believe it, what's next? <laughs> Bannon would later claim that in a civil war that has done more to advance the cause of Catholicity in the States than the hundred years before, the principal cause of this advance has been the charity shown by the religious sisters who tended the sick and wounded. Southern Catholic bishops, chaplains, and sister nurses each answered secular allegiance questions in different ways. Bishops, politically cautious and pastorally active, chaplains, fully committed Confederates, and sister nurses devoid of all political considerations focused primarily on spiritual and physical healing. Yet as mentioned before, all these groups prioritized their religious duties above all else. Even amongst the militarism of chaplains Sheeran, Gosh, and Bannon, the defining feature of their war, war journals and letters is the exercise of their faith. For the chaplains in particular, preparing men for death on the battlefield, hearing their confessions, and granting absolution so that men who did die might do so in a state of grace. Gosh, rejoicing that a man had gone to confession and had received Holy Communion a few days before being killed. Bannon, pleased that a long, unrepentant soldier named McGulf had ab received absolution before dying of mortal wounds. And Sheeran, celebrating Mass in a snowstorm, afterwards leading soldiers in recitation of the Rosary, are the events that make up the bulk of the chaplain's wartime experience. There is variation, at times stark variation, in the way these groups answered secular allegiance questions, but in prioritizing their allegiance to their faith uniformly. Thank you. Afternoon. It's good to see so many old friends and to make sure they don't heckle me, I took my glasses off so I can't see where you are anyway. <laughs> Having been introduced myself at several places where they just go on and on and on to the point that it sounds like a rough draft of an obituary, <laughs> I'm going to keep mine short. It has been said that a true measure of success is to be recognized as one of the best there is at what you do. Our guest speaker today certainly is so recognized. She not only had a distinguished teaching career at Texas State University, she is an award-winning author of books that give us an in-depth look at Southerners, male and female, who face challenges of loyalty, while trying to maintain their social fabric during the tragic Civil War era. She has familial ties to Jones County, Mississippi, which may not mean much to those who live in the other 81 counties, but she has looked at curious and notable events in that county during the war and brought them to light as only a talented scholar could do. And as it turns out, the road to Hollywood goes through Jones County. <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> well, they're excellent in her case because that's exactly where it went through and hopefully will go to completion. Would you please make welcome the 2015 Marslatt lecturer, Dr. Victoria Byron. Sure 
sure I've got all my bells and whistles working here. Mainly make sure I know how to work it. <laughs> yep, it's working okay. All right. Okay, well, I'm just delighted to be here. Uh, I have never been on the campus of Mississippi State before, and uh, it's, it's just a real honor to have been invited and to give this presentation. Uh, and I'm very pleased to speak today on, on Newton Knight and the Free State of Jones, and more broadly on Southern dissent and unionism during the Civil War. Considering that we're, we're celebrating the Civil War sesquicentennial, and I think we're still celebrating, it seems like we've been celebrating it quite a while, but it seems especially important if we're, if we're celebrating that sesquicentennial to reflect on those Southerners who rebelled against the Confederacy. <laughs> and it seems to me like with this movie coming out, uh, it's particularly important uh, with a movie in production <coughs> to examine some of the uh, many versions of Newt Knight that have been presented to us over the years, over the century, and, and more. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do today. Uh, obviously, I can't tell you the whole book that I worked on for so long, but I, I do want to, to, to give this uh, snapshot of, of how Newt Knight has been presented and received or not received over the years. Uh, the history of, of Newt Knight and the Free State of Jones is really part of a larger and longer history of Southern dissent and racial mixing. The long shadow of Newt Knight dovetails with the long shadow of the Civil War. Guerrilla bands were common to the Civil War, while race mixing has been common throughout our nation's history. Still, it's been difficult to understand this Mississippi story, because the legend of the Free State of Jones is shot through with unverifiable fables and legends, many of them repeated in the most popular works on the subject. First and foremost, I'd say those most popular works have been the local histories offered by Newt's son, Tom Knight, and by his grandniece, Ethel Knight. But at the same time that we have uh, all these legends about the Free State, there are many documented facts that exist and that allow us to consider the plausibility of the undocumented stories. On a basic level, it's safe to say that Tom Knight tried to promote and protect his father's heroic image while Ethel Knight, his grandniece from the pro-Confederate side of the family, sought to destroy that image. So let me begin with one indisputable fact. On October 5, 1863, Confederate Colonel Amos McLemore was shot to death in Jones County, Mississippi, as he sat visiting with the Confederate representative, Amos Deason, in Amos Deason's home Ellis, in Ellisville, Mississippi. And there we have a picture of that home, which is cared for and maintained and is a museum today. Colonel McLemore and his soldiers were on assignment to arrest deserters in what was McLemore's home county. His murder has long been attributed to Jones County's most notorious deserter, Newton Knight. This part is conjecture, since no one appears to have ever been charged with the murder, but it's plausible conjecture, particularly since it was never disputed by Newt himself and got a pretty clear endorsement from his chief defender, from Newt's chief defender his son Tom. Killing Amos McLemore, Tom assured his readers, was the sad but unavoidable result of McLemore's own behavior as what he called a news toter, that is an informer, uh, on the outliers, a news toter of information about the outliers to Confederate authorities. It was, Tom explained, as his father had told him, kill or be killed. Newt Knight first deserted the Confederacy at Abbeville following the Battle of Corinth. He was soon arrested and forced back into the army and then deserted a second time at Snyder's Bluff just before the 7th Battalion that he was a member of moved on to Vicksburg uh, in, in May 1863. Newt was a small farmer who owned no slaves. He was in many ways typical of white Southerners who viewed the Civil War as a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. In certain other ways, as we shall see, he was unlike uh, many of the men or most of the men of his time and place. He looked a lot like Matt McConaughey. <laughs> this, I, I can't think of a better way to illustrate the earliest Newt Knight and the latest Newt Knight. Uh, and uh, it really is fairly striking. So as you ponder the images there, the beginning and the, and the latest, uh, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, well, the events following the murder of Amos, Amos McLemore further indicate that Newt Knight was the likely trigger man. Just eight days after McLemore's death, upwards of 55 men gathered together, vowing to fight against 
against the Confederacy and to support the U.S. government, or so they and their defenders did testify beginning in 1870 as Newt Knight sought uh, government compensation, federal compensation, uh, for the band's uh, active role in assisting the Union during the Civil War. Uh, the men elected Newt Knight their captain, and they named their ad hoc military unit the Knight Company. The Free State of Jones, as it is known today, was born with that action following the death of Macklemore. For all of that, the evidence is pretty solid. But even after we established certain facts, there remained the, the, the question of motives. Just as a generation of politicians, historians, or generations, I should say, of politicians, historians, and novelists regularly interpret and reinterpret the meaning of the Civil War, so are the motives and the character of Newton Knight regularly reinterpreted. Northerners, in the heady aftermath of Civil War victory, seized on Newt Knight and the Jones County Uprising as emblematic of a restless and violent society that lay beneath a thin veneer of Southern white upper-class gentility. In his 1886 essay, Pennsylvania's G. Norton Galloway, who won a Medal of Honor for his Civil War service on behalf of the Union, argued that Jones County had formally seceded from the Confederacy and had declared itself a free state during the war. Galloway wildly estimated the band of deserters known as the Knight Company to have included some 10,000 men. Imagine in Jones County. <laughs> he, portrayed them, he portrayed them not so much as patriots to the Union cause as miscreants who took Southern feuding to what he called blood-curdling heights during the Civil War. Plain white Southern men, he, he argued, were a savage backward bunch thanks to the degrading effects of slavery. Galloway... Uh, wanted to make it clear, however, that Northern industrialism, and he thanked God for Northern industrialism, was poised to civilize the poor backwoods Southerners. And so here we have a Northern image of the Knight Company as a bunch of poor white rabble-rousers. And this, and this actually echoed the upper-class Southern images of so-called poor white trash. It was the merits of slaveholding society versus industrial society that the North and South disagreed on. But the Knight Band pretty much uh, got the same sort of treatment from both of them uh, in, in the terms that I've described. Then, about five years later, Albert Bushnell Hart of Harvard University presented Newt Knight as a sort of noble savage patriot in the pages of The Nation magazine. In 1891, Hart repeated Galloway's myth of secession within secession, but now we begin to see a heroic, a more heroic Newt beginning to emerge. Uh, and this Newt vindicated and, and uh, made, was a worthy example of the cause of Northern abolitionism. But Newt didn't remain a hero in the, in the media for long. By 1900, the builders and believers of the Lost Cause version of the war had subverted Northern images of a glorious war of liberation designed to fulfill the promise of the American Revolution. It was now white Southerners who wore the mantle of Republican virtue. The war, they argued, had not been about slavery at all. It was about maintaining constitutional principles against an, increasing, an increasingly oppressive federal government. At the dawn of the 20th century, to be Southern was to be white, and to be white was to revere the lost cause of the Confederacy. The newly founded Journal of Mississippi History dismissed Southern Unionists, such as Newt Knight, as misguided poor whites, ignorant and thankfully few in number. And so this poor white trash image is one that we just keep coming back again and again uh, in regard to not just Newt Knight, but this, this band of men that uh, numbered anywhere from really about 55 to about 100 by the best estimates. <coughs> Presenting the Knight Company once again as poor whites and bandits made their unionism seem to be the exception rather than that, that, that proved the rule. The white South was solid, its effort to form an independent nation, a noble lost cause. In the World War II era, especially uh, as uh, coming on the heels of the Great Depression, historians rediscovered the virtuous, plain, white Southern farmer and began to write uh, quite a few histories about the plain, white Southern farmer. The realization that 75% of Southern households did not own slaves in 1860 on the eve of the Civil War fueled interest in whether class divisions might have existed between slaveholders and non-slaveholders. And if so, what possible connection they might have had to Southern white unionism. 
Reflective of this new national mood was James Street's Tap Roots, a pro-union novel written in 1943 and which he frankly said was inspired by the story of Newt Knight, which he had grown up hearing about all his life. Tap Roots, the publication of Tap Roots, this, this novel that was a very favorable view of Southern Unionism, emboldened Newt's son, Tom Knight, to publish a worshipful biography of his father that he'd written a decade earlier. Following that, in 1948, Universal Studios made a movie based on Street's novel, Tap Roots. So at this point, Newt Knight's brand of Southern Rebellion was back in style. And once again, Newt Knight appeared as a folk hero. But the lost cause was, very, it was still very much alive in 1948, and many of its true believers simmered as Newt Knight achieved hero status as a sort of David who had taken on the Goliath of white slaveholders by refusing to fight their war. In 1951, Ethel Knight fixed all that. Newt's pro-Confederate grandniece brought out the big guns in a largely successful effort to paint Newt Knight as a man who committed treason against his government and against his race. Capitalizing on Southern white opposition to the burgeoning civil rights movement, this is 1951, remember, Ethel made public an open secret that Newt Knight had crossed the color line during and after the Civil War. In her book, The Echo of the Black Horn, Ethel revealed that Newt had fathered numerous children by Rachel, the former slave of his grandfather and an important, and an important accomplice to the Knight Band. Furthermore, Newt didn't hide his behavior, and according to Ethel, he even forced two of his white children to also marry across the color line. Newt and Rachel's own great-grandson, Davis Knight, Ethel pointed out, had been convicted of miscegenation, marrying across the color line, in 1948 for daring to marry a white woman. So it's interesting that during this time, the legend of the Free State of Jones largely disappeared from national consciousness, while locally, it became ever more popular. I mean, what was not, liked, not to like? I mean, you've got it all in Ethel's book. Her book sold very well, and it still does. It quickly eclipsed Tom Knight's book as it popularized images of Newt as a demented, dangerous white man, Rachel as a spell-weaving, green-eyed Jezebel, and 100 or more men as dupes who were somehow persuaded by Newt's hypnotic personality to join his misbegotten plot to overthrow the most no noble government on earth, and that would, of course, be the Confederacy in Ethel's eyes. And so the Jones County uprising emerged during the 1950s as nothing less than an assault on the revered Confederate nation, as a threat to white purity, and white purity was something many white Southerners were extremely worried about during these early stages of the Civil Rights Movement. There things stood in 1984 when historian Rudy Leverett set out to separate myth from fact and to prove that no secession within secession ever took place. Although he achieved that goal, Leverett stopped short of researching the socioeconomic backgrounds of the Knight Company members, dismissing them as, you guessed it, poor white outlaws, and thus reinforcing Ethel's image of treason and banditry. Rudy Leverett chose not to discuss Newt's interracial family at all. And so by largely ignoring the women and families that played such a role in this anti-Confederate uprising, Leverett missed the fundamental elements of this community war, and he left the volatile issue of race untouched. Eight years later, after, uh, after Leverett's book appeared, I began my own study uh, of the Free State of Jones. Many local court records were forever gone, thanks to courthouse fires. But there were still individual military records, the official records of the Union and Confederate armies, federal manuscript censuses, state and territorial records, family papers, and memoirs to consult. Those records, combined with a multitude of interviews, revealed an event deeply rooted in cultural traditions, kinship ties, and ongoing migrations from the southeastern states to the southwestern territories earlier in the century. As important as the story of Newton Rachel is, the Free State of Jones is about so much more than just this one man and this one relationship. The name itself refers to the county's lack of wartime government after it became overrun by deserters. 
The Knight Band was organized, armed, and deadly. Led by Captain Newt Knight, it was composed of men from the region's oldest white settlers. <coughs> Most were thoroughly respectable, though not wealthy. And so how do we reconcile these images? This is what's always been the problem. Yes, this is an inner civil war. Uh, you, you have murders going on. You have people killing one another. It is kill or be killed, as Tom Knight said. And yet, <laughs> these are not families of bandits, outlaws, poor whites. Uh, these are the most respectable families uh, in, in, in this region. And so the larger story is one about what the Civil War did to communities and what, it, it, uh, what, what forces it engendered to bring about this inner Civil War. Getting back to the status of, these, uh, of the members of the men who joined the Night Band and the families that supported them in doing so, I want to talk a little bit about slavery. Slavery conferred prestige, but it was not essential to white respectability in Piney Woods, Mississippi. In other words, you didn't have to be a slaveholder to be among the respectable classes. And one of the problems I think we've, we've seen in, in history, uh, in Southern history, has long been a tendency to always divide the society between the slaveholders and the poor whites. But there's, there's this vast middling yeomanry uh, that's very much a part of Jones County. This was not the land of cotton plantations, and only 12.2% of Jones County's households held slaves in 1860, compared to a state average of just over 55%. So that's quite a comparison, 12.2% versus a state average of 55%. Most members of the night band belonged to this non-slaveholding majority, while the strongest supporters of the Confederacy in Jones County belonged to that county's small slaveholding and commercial elite. Of the approximately 95 men who eventually joined the night company, the overwhelming majority owned land but no slaves. Eleven of them were small slaveholders or lived in slaveholding households uh, of families divided in their support for the Confederacy. Kinship, it quickly became clear as I did my research, was extremely important to this uprising. Among the Knight Band's 55 core members, 26 of them shared six surnames. We got some cousins and brothers here all <laughs> banded together. These families had intermarried with one another for several generations, in some cases long before entering Mississippi territory. The migration patterns are very much a, a kind of a caravan pattern where large, uh, uh, or, or large and small uh, numbers of family members would migrate and then others would later follow. Most were related either to Captain Newton Knight or to his first and second lieutenants, James Morgan Valentine and Simeon Collins. In fact, this band, I, I, I always love to point out, would be much more accurately termed the, the Knight Valentine Collins Band. Those were the three family names that most uh, dominated. This is Jasper Collins, a uh, very, very important uh, member of the Knight Band. Uh, and his, he had several brothers in the band as well as a, a multitude of cousins. Social divisions as well as kinship created neighborhoods that were pro or anti-Confederate. Branches of the same family were often divided according to whether or not they owned slaves. Informally, the band relied on support from women, children, aged parents, and a few slaves. This is James Morgan Valentine, first lieutenant of the Knight Company, very closely uh, interrelated also with the Collinses and the Knights. Uh, and here we have, oops, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you see my slides are out of out of out of, uh, out of order. Let me see if the next one is the one I want. Yes, this is the one I want. Ella Fair Chain. Um, well, I take that back. I'm going to go back here. I'm going to do it this way. Okay. This is a this is a, a grave that is contained in the uh, graveyard of Newt Knights. Uh, grandfather, John Jackie Knight, one of the earliest settlers of the Jones County uh, area. This grave uh, is, was, was erected, I believe, in the 1940s. And these are three men who were killed by um, uh, the Lowry, uh, Colonel Lowry and his soldiers when they came into, um, into Jones County seeking uh, deserters. Uh, Pre-war, okay, just a second, I've lost my place here. Okay. Pre-war feuds, marital alliances, and economic relations all shaped the loyalties of these families. 
One family, however, that I've mentioned already, the Collinses, was so consistently pro-union that one could pretty well predict the unionism of any family branch that intermarried with them. Newt Knight himself credited Jasper Collins with convincing him to desert after passage of the 20 Negro Law. And it was the war itself that created the final divisions. The Battle of Corinth and the passage of the 20 Negro Law, uh, both in October 1862, as well as the siege of uh, Vicksburg from May 17th until the 4th of July 1863, made unionists out of fence sitters, convincing many men to join the night band by early 1864. By March 1864, five months after the murder of Major McLemore, deserters were reported to have taken over Jones County. General Dabney Morey reported to Confederate Secretary of War Seddon on March 3rd that Jones's deserters were well-armed and 500 strong. This is a quote from those records, from that letter from Dabney Morey to the Secretary of War. They have been seizing government stores, he wrote, killing our people, and have actually made prisoners of and paroled officers of the Confederate Army. On the same day, Lieutenant General Leonidas Polk reported to Confederate headquarters that Jones County deserters had murdered a conscript officer, pillaged local citizens' houses, and launched a successful raid on government stores at Paulding in neighboring Jasper County. During the same month, deserters reportedly flew a federal flag over the Jones County Courthouse. Alarmed by such reports, the Confederacy sent two major expeditions into Jones County during the months of March and April 1864, the most important of which was headed by Colonel Robert Lowry, who I just mentioned and who later would serve as governor of the state. The infamous Lowry raids on Jones County resulted in the killing of 10 band members in the space of a few days. And that's where this, this mass grave comes into place. These three men, Silman Coleman, T.H. Whitehead, uh, Thomas, it says Yates, but it was actually Yates. These are uh, identified as the grandsons of John Jackie Knight, buried here uh, in unmarked graves. They were summarily executed by the Confederate cavalry uh, during the war between the states because of their honest convictions, April 16, 1864. And this really demonstrates, and this is, this is during the um, 1940s, as I said earlier, when uh, there was much more positive attention being given to the night ban, and before uh, the echo of the Black Horn, the, uh, the thoroughly you know, anti-Newt Knight book published by Ethel Knight had been published. This is before that. And so you can kind of see the positive attention being given to the sacrifices uh, of members of the Knight Band during the Civil War itself. Uh, and this, this gravestone was erected by uh, some of the descendants of members of the Knight Band. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Women were very much a part of this, and now we'll get this, this picture. This woman has the wonderful name of Ella Fair Chain. I just love that. Confederate, she was a Confederate widow, but she actually, uh, after, after becoming widowed by the war, uh, turned and gave her aid to the night band and, and became one of the most important women involved with it. What the women often did was, well, they would blow on horns to warn the men, uh, to warn the deserters if the Confederacy was in the area. They would feed them. They would shelter them. Uh, they played extremely important roles. Sometimes they, would, um, sometimes they would poison the hounds of the Confederate soldiers who used the hounds, of course, to hunt down the men. Uh, as an old man, Newt Knight himself recalled uh, Colonel Lowry's use of, of uh, bloodhounds, but he also remembered the role played by women in thwarting Confederate forces. Here's a quote from Newt in a 1921 uh, interview just a year before he died. He, Newt said, those ladies sure helped us a lot, he told us to Biggs Frost of the New Orleans item, uh, who had managed to snag this interview in 1921. He said, Newt said, they had 44 bloodhounds after us, those boys and General Robert Lowry's men. But 42 of them hounds just naturally died. They'd get hungry, and some of the ladies, friends of ours, would feed them. And they die. Strange, wasn't it? You can tell that in 1921, Newt was still very much enjoying that story. Still, the night band was severely crippled by Lowry's raid. At least 16 of its men were, were 10 were killed, as I've as I pointed out, but at least 16 of them were also captured and forced back into the Confederate Army uh, on threat of execution. Soon, those men found themselves fighting the battle at Kennesaw Mountain, Georgia. 
uh, where they were captured in July 1864 and then sent on to Yankee prison camps where nobody believed they actually supported the Union cause uh, once they got into those Yankee prison camps. And there they stayed for the remainder of the war. In the immediate aftermath of Lowry's raid, uh, as independent researcher Ed Payne's research has revealed, uh, a general fleeing of men from the Piney Woods region of Mississippi produced over 200 enlistees for the Union Army's 1st and 2nd Regiments of the New Orleans Infantry. Up until um, Ed Payne conducted this research, I thought the number was more, just from the Piney Woods we're talking about here, from the Jones County region, I thought it was more like about 40. But he got in there and started digging into those records and, and found over 200. So uh, there, was, there was quite a, a movement uh, into New Orleans, into the Union Army during this period of time, particularly following Lowry's uh, raid on Jones County. About 20 members of the Knight Band, including uh, Newt Knight himself and his first sergeant, Jasper Collins, remained in the swamps, uncaptured and unrepentant. And unrepentant they remained. In 1904, Jasper Collins vowed to an interviewer that he would get up on the coldest night he ever saw to kill Colonel Lowry if he knew he was passing through Jones County. <laughs> this was serious business. <laughs> As for Newt Knight himself, late in life he expressed regret that the South's farmers had not risen up and just killed the slaveholders rather than be tricked into fighting their war for them. By this point, it's safe to say Newt was disgusted by the government's failure to compensate him and his men. He had been suing for almost, or petitioning, it wasn't really a suit per se. He'd been petitioning the government uh, for close to 30 years at that point for compensation and uh, had, had been denied each and every time and would be finally denied in 19, just as the 20th century dawned in, uh, in, in, well, actually, yeah, right around 1900. What local folks seem to best remember today, or at least back when I first started my interviews, in addition to the story of Newt and Rachel, are the folk tales and legends that grew ever larger in the aftermath of the Civil War. The Deason House that I showed earlier, uh, where Newt Knight allegedly murdered Amos McLemore, is, of course, today a haunted house. Ellisville's own paranormal society has conducted studies on various phenomena reported there. Blood is said to regularly seep up from the floor on which Macklemore died. A chair on the porch inexplicably rocks at certain times of the night. And there is the tale, and this is my favorite one of all. I just love this story. Uh, and I found this in the WPA records. Uh, in time and time again, people were still telling this in the 1930s uh, to their uh, WPA interviewers. There, it's the tale of Newt Knight's cousin, Ben Knight, who was captured by Lowry's men and hanged on the spot. The story goes that soldiers ran Ben down with those infamous hounds that the women had poisoned, or later poisoned. Ben went down fighting, ripping the hounds' flesh with his knife as they ripped at his own with their fangs. When finally the Confederates prepared to hang him and exhausted Ben, begged for water, which was denied to him. As late as the 1930s, old timers told the WPA interviewers that water bubbled up from his grave as his body was lowered into the ground. These are the kind of tales that remind us, much like the gore of battlefield deaths, that these inner civil wars were traumatic community events expressed thereafter in <coughs> ghost stories and tales of divine intervention. The story of Ben is so emotionally gripping that both the pro and anti-Confederate sides of the family still strive to lay claim to it. Even though records confirm that Ben Knight was a member of the Knight Band, Ethel Knight absolved the Confederacy of blame for his death by claiming that furlough papers were found in Ben's pocket after he was hanged. There were no furlough papers in Ben's pocket, by the way. He, he may have had, uh, he had been at Vicksburg and probably what he had was the release uh, you know, during that period of time of men uh, from Vicksburg, but that was not a, a furlough, and th th it was a different thing. Despite Lowry's devastating raid, Newt Knight, Jasper Collins, and, and about 18 others managed to hold on until war's end, never captured. When the war ended in May 1865, Jones County Unionists were poised to fight for control over the county's reconstruction. That would be a losing battle. At the same time, Newt and Rachel's lives remained intertwined after the war when their families lived and worked together on his farm. Rachel's children, all of whom apparently had white fathers, grew up with the nine children of Newt Knight and his wife, Serena. 
Now, this is no simple story of a white man crossing the color line with a woman of color, so you kind of have to stay with me. Not only did Newt and Rachel have children together, but two of Newt and Serena's children, Molly and Matt, also married two of Rachel's children, Jeffrey and Fanny. And there is no evidence, despite what Ethel Knight said, that Newt Knight forced these marriages. They seem to have been entirely consensual uh, among young adults who had grown up to, uh, nearby uh, in adjoining houses uh, since the beginning of their lives. Later, it appears that Newt may also have fathered children by uh, Rachel's oldest daughter, George Ann, after her death. In sum, there were four primary interracial relationships among the Knights that led to the growth of what was often called the white Negro com community or the Knight community. Newt Knight presided openly over this mixed race community, distributing land among his mistresses as well as his children. And interestingly enough, while Serena left his household, none of us should be very surprised by that, uh, she didn't leave the mixed race community. She remained a part of it as well. Uh, and she lived with her daughter, Molly, who was married to Rachel's son, Jeffrey. And so whether in, intended or not, whether by choice or not, Serena was part of the mixed race community her entire life, even after she chose to no longer live with Newt himself. A few of the family pictures here. This is the family of Jeffrey and Molly. That's, um, let me see if I can get this little pointer to work. This is Molly Knight. Serena Knight and, and Newt Knight's daughter. Uh, this is Jeffrey Knight. This is Rachel, Rachel's son by uh, a different a white man in the community, probably Newt Knight's uncle, who for a time uh, claimed her as a slave. And these are their children uh, surrounding them. This young man right here is Otho Knight, and it's his son, Davis Knight, who would be charged with miscegenation in 1948 for uh, marrying uh, a, a white woman. I should point out that that generation of children that are all standing behind Molly and Jeffrey all chose to identify as white uh, and moved off to, into area. Some of them stayed in the um, in the so-so area with great consequences. That's why Davis Knight ended up being uh, tried and convicted. But uh, many others of them, or several others of them, moved off to uh, Arkansas and even as far away as California. So it was this history, uh, one that was whispered about, but, n but therefore never publicly written about, that Ethel Knight made the centerpiece of Echo of the Black Horn. In the 1950s segregated South, Newt Knight was finished as a hero once that came out, except for those few who looked beyond Ethel's saga of forbidden lust and banditry to the story of unionism and insurrection in which it was wrapped. Unfortunately, the impulse to make a complex story simple, and this is a very complex story, I hope I've made clear, seems never ending. While many pro-Confederate Civil War enthusiasts still dismiss the Jones County uprising as the work of one treasonous murderer, and that would be Newt Knight that they're talking about, uh, the most recent rendering of the story has him leaping tall buildings in a single bound to rid the South of all of its ills. You know what I'm <laughs> In 2009, there appeared yet another version of the Free State of Jones, this one authored by sports journalist Sally Jenkins and Harvard professor John Stouffer. Entitled The State of Jones, this history revived the myth of secession within secession with its subtitle, The Small Southern County That Seceded from the Confederacy. N never mind that both Newton Knight and Jasper Collins during their lifetime said, no, we never seceded from the Confederacy. We just fought against, fought against it. Uh, but never mind, it was back. And this book also provided a stirring 15-page description of Newt Knight's travails at Vicksburg, although the evidence shows that Newt deserted the 7th Battalion Mississippi Inf Infantry at Snyder's Bluff just before it marched to Vicksburg. State of Jones then recast Newt Knight as the great white hope of Southern abolitionism, a man, we are told, who, quote, burst free of racial barriers and forged bonds of alliance with blacks that were unmatched even by northern abolitionists. Unmatched even by northern abolitionists. In fact, Newt Knight is pretty much uh, presented as a northern John, version of John Brown. Newt was no longer the product of social forces. He was the social force. 
Well, thankfully, when we place the story of Newt and Rachel within the Jones County uprising, the larger contours of the uprising, and remember the other men who were equally, if not more important than Newt Knight in forming this band, we're able to transcend both the lost cause and the neo-abolitionist dramas that have dominated the history of its telling. We then see a community <coughs> divided along lines of kinship, neighborhood, and political ideology, one in which ordinary people took extraordinary measures to survive the devastation of war. And it's important to remember that the Free State of Jones is only one example of the communities of dissent that dotted the landscape of the Civil War South, many of which erupted into bloody inner civil wars. And yes, ordinary folks murdered one another with shocking frequency in these wars, people who would never commit an act of war in normal times. Understanding their larger context reveals the forces that impelled men like Newt Knight to arm themselves against the Confederacy. And it helps us as well to understand the true impact and the devastating cost of America's <coughs> civil war. Thank you. We'll have a chance for questions, but we'd like like to have you get a chance to talk to uh, Vicki more personally rather than try to do it this whole area. Jean? It is always a pleasure for Janet and me to participate in this annual lecture. Every one of these 13 lectures have been mem memorable. We have been fortunate to hear promising graduate students and established scholars present excellent papers on a variety of topics. When John and I established this library fund in 2002, it was Dean Francis Coleman who suggested that we work together with the library to highlight the fund with an annual lecture. It was also she who recommended that an MSU history graduate student share the podium each year with an established scholar. The result has been a wonderful event that we are proud of sharing every March. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to Vicki and to Greg and to Gresham. Russian, Russian. <laughs> I finally got it for your wonderful papers. Greg, and Greg, um, I gave you a, a little extra credit, but well, we're happy to have you here along with me. <laughs> well, Gene mentioned this, but it uh, it seems like only yesterday we were talking with the dean about this that. Uh, Gene and I met with uh, Dean Francis Coleman to establish this uh, library fund, and it was, as Jean said, it was her wise suggestion that we annually invite a prominent historian and a rising MSU history graduate student to make presentations, to give particularly the graduate student the experience of doing this, and also to highlight the fund. If you look at the back of your program, and I hope you've had a chance to do that, you'll see a listing of the major historians who in previous years have, have spoken to us. Some are now deceased, unfortunately, but most remain leaders in their fields of expertise. And I think an important thing is we've been very fortunate that every year the prominent historian who has spoken understands the importance of reaching out to the general public, not just talking to other historians, but reaching out to the general public to make history come alive. Dr. Victoria Bynum, Vicki uh, for short, I think is an excellent example of this, this kind of historian. As Mike said, she has a national reputation as a scholar. She was, until she retired from Texas State University, uh, an inspiring teacher there. And even in her retirement, she continues her teaching role, actually now more spectacularly than ever, uh, by advising the production of this motion picture about the free, so-called free state of Jones. You know, we're just really honored that, that she's with us today, and we're really honored, too, that her husband, uh, Dr. Dr. Greg Andrews, is also with us uh, we haven't had a chance to say much about him, but he's a published scholar in his own right, 
uh, doing work in uh, labor history, and uh, we go on and on and on. But he was a member of the, um, of the faculty at uh, Texas State University uh, where they met, actually. And we found out that they had met five years earlier in graduate school and didn't pay any attention to each other until they met again in, in, in Texas. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit, okay. <laughs> well, maybe I should have said Vicky didn't pay any attention you know, to you. But, uh, okay. <laughs> um, so we're really honored that he's here. If you get a chance to talk to him, uh, as, as we have today with the uh, library coordinators and with the, uh, uh, with the, the uh, scholars, presidential scholars over in uh, Griffiths, uh, you'll know what, what an interesting individual he is and the good work that he's accomplished. But I have to tell you, uh, as thrilled as I am personally to have these two with us, I'm really thrilled to have our graduate student speaker here. Because if you've got a name like Marzalak, actually Marsawek is the proper pronunciation. I, I knew from the very minute I re we, we looked at his proposal that Gratian Kraszewski had to be an outstanding graduate student. <laughs> no, Kraszewski, Kraszewski, I mean, it just thrills me to, to repeat that, uh, repeat that now. I love the sound of it. He is, as, as you might guess, uh, 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 he's a joint citizen of Poland and the United States, but like I am, he's an American of Polish extraction. And we share a, a lot, obviously, because of our background, but I have to tell you, his Polish is a heck of a lot better than, than mine. There's no, 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 absolutely no com comparison. So we're really excited that he's here. And I think just in listening to him and listening how he organized his, his paper, that this is a young man we're going to hear a great deal about uh, in the future. So I'm going to ask Gene to come up. And Gracia, if you come up, uh, just come up for a second. We'd like to... Um, make a presentation on behalf of the library and the Marzalax of a, of a small honorarium for which we done. And finally, as you might guess, I, I can't let you go and, and uh, have uh, Ryan uh, talk to us uh, finally, but I, I, I've got to say something about the Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library. <laughs> we can't let this go by. I want to give you a personal invitation to visit us here and join us beginning in May of this year to watch the construction of the fourth floor on the library, our new home. And uh, we're working with architects. The dean has been a very, uh, played an essential role in this and the administration. And we're as excited as can be that this is going to happen. But in the meantime, we... What's that? No, <laughs> no, you don't. You don't want to come hard for the next year, so you better come now because the noise is going to be overwhelming. But we are excited about that, and we do hope. If you haven't seen it, we're happy to show it to you today or any time that's uh, convenient. And thank you all for being here. I. Uh Echo Dr. Marzalek's thanks. Uh, we really do appreciate everyone coming out for the uh, John and Jean Marzalek lecture. Um, what's also important about the Marzalek lecture is the fact that it is tied to the John and Jean Marzalek Fund. Uh, the John and Jean Marzalek Fund uh, provides money to the MSU libraries for the purchase of primary source material, resources that our graduate students, our historians, and our patrons can use to conduct their own historical research. And uh, if you know John Marslake, you know that he, he's primarily known as a Civil War historian, but he is a prolific writer in other fields of American history, uh, including the Jacksonian era, and uh, he interest in, has written in uh, race relations and modern American civil rights. Um, so every year we try to find good primary source material that we can add to the collections. Um, and not just add to special collections, but into the general collection as well, because we want our students to be able to check the material out. And as the archivist, you don't take anything out of our <laughs> special collections. <laughs> it all stays here in the library. But we want primary sources that students can bring home to do their research. Uh, this year, we have um, decided to kind of get a number of materials, published documents, published primary source material. Um, and we've got one, two, three, four, 
five different resources that we're going to get. Um, we've purchased the uh, six volume set of the letters of William Cullen Bryant, um, early member of the Republican Party, uh, poet, and um, uh, newspaper editor. We've got uh, the one volume set of the one volume, it's not a set, of the letters of Jesse Benton Fremont. She is a prolific writer of the American West. Um, she went out west with her husband, John C. Fremont, um, who was the uh, first candidate uh, uh, for the Republican nomination. Um, we are purchasing a four volume set of the papers of Zebulon Baird Vance, mainly just because of the name. Um, but, uh, no, actually, though, uh, Zebulon Vance is a pretty important person in the 19th century. He's a Confederate officer, governor of North Carolina, senator from North Carolina, and these papers really show you a lot about internal politics in uh, North Carolina during the Civil War. Um, we have a set of the Booker T. Washington papers here at Mississippi State, and I think it's actually really good to know that some of them need to be replaced <laughs> because of wear and tear and use. So what we're going to do is replace some of the volumes of the papers of Booker T. Washington. I, you, you would think librarians wouldn't want books that are all worn and torn, but that means people are checking them out, and we're happy about that. Um, and then finally, we're going to uh, purchase a six-volume set of the letters and papers and writings and journals of James Fenimore Cooper, <coughs> obviously the author of The Last of the Mohicans and a very important prolific writer and one of the first you know, really world-renowned American writers. So um, we want to thank you all for attending today. Um, is there anything else? I have some questions. Very good. And now, Dean Coleman. First, I think it would be appropriate for us to hear from the audience as to any questions. Dr. Bannon, would you join me up to uh, questions that you all might have about her presentation or about her writings? Uh, we had some <coughs> earlier, very interesting. Uh, we, we would like to keep both of them, uh, but we can't do that today. But do you have any questions of her? Sure. <laughs> In your research, did you... Across the name Dabney? Yeah, Dabney, well, Maury, or are you not talking about Dabney Maury, are you? Or no, you mean the last name, Dabney? I believe it was introduced in chapter. Oh, well, that, that, isn't that the fictional name that, that Jane Street gave oh, well, to? Uh, and I think that that Knight. would be, yeah, that would be uh, John Jackie Knight, right? Those are my Knight people over here. Yeah, is Dabney, yeah. I, I read as much of James Street as I could. In fact, I quote him above, above most of my chapters in there. Uh, you, know, you can start off with uh, Pichamango and then go on to Capu uh, and then go on to Mingo who ended up in Cuba. Cuba, I know, <laughs> I know. And then there's that old promised land that, that really, I, that was really helpful uh, for me in giving me a, a real flavor of the frontier. Yeah, I love those books. Thank you. Yes? Do you have any concerns what Hollywood might do to your book? I have many concerns. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, we've, we've been talking about this a this afternoon, or earlier today. Um, I don't expect the movie to, you know, the, the movie is not based on my book. It's an original script written by uh, Gary Ross. And I don't expect it to, to you know, I adhere to the, the details and facts as I know them, uh, what I hope it tells is a plausible story that gives the essential truth of the story of Newt Knight. Uh, I, 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 for example, I know that there's a creation of a black character in there, a runaway slave that Newt Knight will become involved with while he's on the lamb and they're helping each other. Well, there's no evidence that that happened. That's very plausible. I mean, Newt Knight was obviously in communication uh, with blacks uh, not just Rachel, but <laughs> with people of color. So, so it's plausible that he would have had an alliance like that. And that's an example of the kind of creative license in a movie that I'm okay with that. And, and uh, you know, I know it's, it has to be an entertaining and, and uh, coherent story in two hours. I just hope it, it does convey the essential truth that we're, we're interested in seeing of who Newt Knight was, what this rebellion was. 
Uh, it's, it's, of course, going to be primarily about Ruth Knight, but I hope that there's enough. Uh, Jasper Collins will be included in it. Uh, another associate of Newt Knight's who really existed, W.W. Uh, w. Sumrall, will be included. And so I'm hoping that the sense also that this was a community war is maintained, even though I know it's going to be largely a biography, a very exciting biography of Newt Knight. Any other questions? We cannot let our special guest get away without presenting her with a very special symbol of Mississippi State University. And this is from the President's office, and guess what it is? No. <laughs> so we want you to take that home. Okay. And certainly we uh, want to congratulate our graduate student, Mr. Kirschkiff. Kind of close. Mike, we're glad to have you back with us, and we're going to call on you again. And uh, Dr. Bruce, I don't want to overlook you, even though I see you quite often at the dean's meeting. Thank you for being here. And I would like to thank Ryan for his work. And let's please thank the Marzalax again. Please join us for a reception, and if you want to meet with our uh, guests, please feel free to do so. Hey, John. Hey, John.